Black shredded wings, cannon shells tore through fuselages, engines lost oil. By every engineering rule, they should have fallen out of the sky. Yet some World War II fighters could not. Today, we are ranking fighters not by firepower or kill ratios, but by raw ruggedness. So which five fighters were the hardest to shoot down? In terms of sheer damage tolerance, the Corsair was exceptionally difficult to destroy. Its fuselage used advanced spot welding to produce a flush, low-drag skin while retaining impressive strength. Combat reports routinely described Corsairs returning with large portions of tail surfaces missing. The Corsair structure centered on a massive inverted gull-wing mainspar, which is one of the strongest fighter wing designs of the war. This configuration enabled clearance for the enormous 13-foot propeller without fragile landing gear. While outer wing panels after the spar were fabric-covered, the internal structure was extremely rigid. Pilot survivability was taken seriously. Protection included a 1.5-inch bullet-resistant windscreen and armored seat back and headrest. The 237-gallon main fuel tank was moved to the fuselage after early models wing tanks proved prone to leaks and fires. Power came from the Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp, which was one of war's most durable engines. As an air-cooled radial, it lacked vulnerable coolant systems and could absorb expensive cylinder damage while continuing to run. Despite its combat toughness, the F4U was demanding to maintain. The hydraulic wing fold system often leaked in corrosive Pacific conditions, and its flush spot-welded skin was difficult to repair in the field, compared to riveted designs like the Hellcat. Fabric wing panels were easier to patch, but often suffered from rapid decay in tropical climates. The Wildcat quickly earned a reputation for absorbing punishment, especially when compared to lightly built opponents like the Mitsubishi Zero. By the Battle of Midway, the Wildcat's standard armor and self-sealing fuel tanks made it the U.S. Navy's durable carrier fighter. Although some aces favored the early war Dash 3 version for its larger ammunition load, the newer Dash 4 established the era's baseline for survivability. Grumman's semi monocoque construction philosophy emphasized strength over refinement. The Wildcat's reinforced internal framing and stressed skin allowed it to withstand violent G loads during abrupt pullouts and defensive maneuvers. Pilot protection included armor plating and nearly 4 inch steel headrest, but the layout had inherent risks. The Dash 4 version had the main fuel tank sat directly beneath the cockpit floor. The manually operated landing gear could result in slipped crank that would violently spin backward and caused serious pilot injury. The Wildcat was powered by the Pratt & Whitney Twin Wasp 14-cylinder radial engine, known for reliability and tolerance of damage. The engine could continue running despite losing a few cylinders, and its cooling system was compactly integrated within the cowling. The Wildcat's simplicity was its greatest logistical strength. Largely free of complex hydraulics, its manually driven landing gear used the chain and sprocket system that could be serviced with basic tools. In austere environments like Henderson Field, this mechanical simplicity proved invaluable. The FW-190 gained a real survivability edge from its unconventional electric philosophy. Landing gear and flaps were driven by decentralized electric motors rather than centralized hydraulics, which eliminated the risk of a single hit bleeding the entire system dry. Damage was therefore localized. A severed wire disabled only one function and not the whole aircraft. Structurally, the FW-190 was exceptionally rigid. Its wing was built as a single, dual-spar unit passing through the fuselage in a continuous box structure. This design provided immense torsional stiffness and resistance to twisting. The FW-190's integrated spar often remained intact even after severe damage. Pilot protection of FW-190 was among the best of the war. Armor included an 8mm seat back, 14mm armored headrest, and a 60mm armored windscreen set at roughly 60 degrees, providing excellent ballistic deflection. The BMW 801 radial engine removed the vulnerability of liquid cooling systems and was heavily protected at the front by a 5mm armored ring. However, its ring-shaped oil tank sat in the extreme nose, making it susceptible to frontal hits. A puncture could rapidly oil coat the windscreen, causing reduced visibility. The FW-190 excelled in maintainability through its craft eye, or power egg concept. The engine, oil tank, and cooling system formed a single, modular unit with standardized quick disconnects. In frontline conditions, complete engine changes could be performed in several hours, which was far faster than contemporary fighters. 
The Hellcat recorded the highest survival rate of any U.S. Navy fighter in the Pacific. Its airframe emphasized redundancy and brute strength over finesse. Hellcats routinely returned with shredded control surfaces or wings perforated by Japanese 7.7mm and 20mm fire. The Hellcat was deliberately overbuilt. Its thick, boxy wings retained exceptional stiffness during high-speed dives. The semi-monocoque structure was so strong that the cockpit section usually remained intact following a crash landing. Pilot protection was a central design goal. Approximately 212 pounds of armor surrounded the cockpit, including an armored seat back and headrest to counter rear aspect attacks. Forward protection came from a flat 1.5-inch bullet-resistant windscreen. The Hellcat was powered by the Pratt & Whitney Double Wasp, which was one of war's most durable engines. Its air-cooled radio configuration eliminated the vulnerability of liquid cooling systems and allowed continued operation after losing cylinders. Designed for relentless carrier operations, the Hellcat emphasized maintainability. Large access panels allowed rapid servicing between sorties, and the landing gear was engineered to survive repeated hard carrier landings. Standardized components and conservative engineering made repair straightforward for Navy mechanics. While it lacked the modular engine concepts seen in German fighters, the Hellcat's simplicity ensured high availability despite the logistical strain of extended Pacific campaigns. The P-47 set the benchmark for wartime fighter survivability. At roughly 7 tons combat weight, it represented the upper extreme of single-engine durability. While it could absorb 20mm cannon hits, the massive airframe, armored bulkhead and sheer volume meant German 7.92mm rounds rarely reached vital systems. Structurally, the Thunderbolt was extraordinarily strong. Its multi-spar wing and rigid fuselage keel created a stable gun platform and tolerated immense G-loads. Early variants, however, suffered from an aero-elastic flaw that sometimes causing catastrophic failure, and the later dorsal fin fillet corrected this. Despite early issues, the structure itself already exceeded pilot physiological limits. The P-47's cockpit was among the safest of the war featuring a 38mm bullet-resistant windscreen and extensive enclosed steel armor that could easily deflect 7.92mm rounds. The Pratt & Whitney radial engine was exceptionally resilient, capable of operating with severe cylinder damage. The vulnerability lay not in the engine, but in its support systems. The oil coolers and intercooler were the primary weak points. Damage caused by German 20mm rounds could rapidly drain oil or disrupt induction, causing immediate power loss, especially at higher altitude. Maintenance was a compromise between toughness and complexity. The turbo supercharger system was demanding and time-consuming to maintain, compared to simpler fighters. However, the air-cooled radial didn't have the fragile radiators and coolant lines of liquid-cooled designs. The P-47 tolerated rough fields and frontline abuse well, earning its reputation as a fighter built to survive harsh conditions and keep flying. Thank you for watching, and see you in our next videos.